Good morning. I'm Kerry Sulkowitz, the president-elect of the American Psychoanalytic Association. And I'm here this morning with my friend Mira Ehrlich Ginor, who's a training and supervising analyst in the Israel Psychoanalytic Society and former chair of its education committee. Mira has been involved in many aspects of psychoanalytic education for almost two decades in her society, in the European Psychoanalytic Foundation, and in the IPA. She chaired the EPF Working Party on Education for several years and has done a great deal of work on psychoanalytic education. She was one of the architects of the End of Training Evaluation Project, and Mira also recently completed two terms as European representative on the IPA board. I could tell you much, much more about Mira, but you will hear more about her work uh, as we have this conversation today. One thing that I will mention though, which is so relevant to today's conversation is that Mira has been in a number of leadership roles in the group relations field in Israel and around the world, and is especially involved in group work having to do with the transgenerational transmission of trauma. She is the co-founder of PCCA, which is the Partners for Confronting Collective Atrocities. That's an organization dedicated to work with the aftermath of collective atrocities. And PCCA, I'm really happy to say, is one of this year's recipients of the Sigourney Awards. So welcome, Mira. It's very happy to have you here. Hi, Carrie. <laughs> it's nice to have this opportunity to uh, share and exchange uh, thoughts. Great, And I'm great. looking forward to your questions. I have a lot of questions for you, Mira. The, the, the first one really, which is uh, really gets right to the point of, of our having this conversation at this particular moment in time in history really, is that um, you know, we are speaking on the 20th of July, 2020. And the world, of course, has been grappling with several overlapping crises really precipitated by this global pandemic of the coronavirus. Um, no one in the world has been untouched by it. And it's a pandemic of unprecedented scale, which has brought about um, untold um, health and economic and social devastation. Uh, and of course, the psychoanalytic world is not immune to this crisis and has been responding in a, in a range of ways around the world. And uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to speak with you this morning is because I read a brief paper that you wrote recently on the, uh, the way that the Israel Psychoanalytic Society has responded to this crisis. And I thought it would be interesting for our listeners to, to hear you talk a bit about how the IPS has responded. So please tell us about, uh, about the unique response in Israel. Uh, yes, I, I think that um, it is a unique uh, response, mm -hmm. unique in the sense that as far as I, uh, I have inquired in other societies, uh, each society has dealt on a societal level, a psychoanalytic society, has dealt with the pandemic and uh, its attack on us as persons and us as, uh, as uh, professionals in different ways. And I found that the uh, response and uh, what the Israeli Psychoanalytic Society mobilized is unique. I may be wrong, but for this, we have to do a survey <laughs> all around. I did only a partial one. So I, I tell you shortly what, uh, or long, <laughs> or in a long way. What happened was, uh, was a very special combination. We had uh, in uh, early March, the uh, World Health Organization has uh, announced of a pandemia. Very soon after that, there were elections in Israel, general elections in Israel, for the third time in one year which has never happened before, because there is a political tie. So in a way, uh, from the beginning, the pandemic uh, was, uh, went together with a political situation. And somehow the two 
very uh, moving events uh, caught us and, and the response, the responses were to both of them. So uh, the third election, uh, again, uh, the results were a tie, a political tie. And political manipulation started to happen parallel to the increase of uh, infection and, um, and the frightening uh, broadcast night after night of what is going to happen to us. Italy was then the, the epitome of the worst case scenario. And we are going to be like Italy and we are going, it's uh, worse worse happening since uh, since the Middle Age and uh, worse than the Spanish flu and so on. And uh, in a fast track, we all started to be in a, in a trauma. We, we went into a traumatic uh, state of mind and uh, in a, I would say in a shock. And a lot of interesting things happened during this situation of the shock. So uh, the first, uh, first thing that was done in the Israeli psychoanalytic uh, society was the creation of a, polit of a WhatsApp uh, group called um, uh, Worried uh, Psychoanalysts. And this had to do with the current political development and um, upset about uh, the developments and call for demonstrations and sharing information about demonstration and so on. And this was an informal uh, group. This was an informal group of Israeli psychoanalysts that, on WhatsApp. Right. Whoever wanted could join. Yeah. Half of the society joined. Now, uh, maybe I should say, Israeli society has now 300 members and 100 candidates. And it's a very, very fast growing and thriving and lively and creative society. So um, the first step was uh, the political uh, 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 coming together. But as the discussion went on, it appeared that there is a need to discuss the political uh, upheaval and uh, steps to be taken and activity to, uh, to do. But also there were all kinds of questions concerning how do we deal with the pandemia on a professional uh, level? Shall we move to work uh, from a distance? How do we do it at all? Uh, at all? Most of us never had any experience in working remotely, which is not not necessarily the case in uh, any other, other society, but in the Israel uh, Psychoanalytic Society, very few of us had, had such uh, experiences. So uh, we needed like um, another group to deal specifically with uh, professional questions. And this uh, group was initiated by, uh, by the board of the IPS, and it, called, it was a term, place, space for thinking, place for thinking. And this is the, the interesting groups. So the, the, we had two WhatsApp groups. Each one of them had about half of the members of the society, 150 members each, which is a lot for a WhatsApp group. And uh, the discussions uh, went uh, on the two different tracks, one on the political track and the other one on the professional turning to personal track. And uh, the place for thinking became within hours, so emotionally loaded and so uh, challenging intellectually and professionally that um, I thought uh, 
really we we have here in uh, a once in a lifetime uh, situation and it is so interesting and we have to make the most out of it uh, in order to learn and also because uh, realizing that we are in a shock and in the midst of a trauma of a kind uh, it will fade out very quickly so it is important to uh, record it in a way because we will forget how it was so after a few hours i suggested that we we summarize every day what has happened in this whatsapp group and um, in, in a very short time uh, a group of uh, six people coalesced around me and we took about ourselves for eight weeks to write daily summaries of the exchange of the WhatsApp exchange. And uh, then we delivered it uh, to the group. And it was like, um, you know, um, it was a combination of I hear you, I see you, and this is what I think about what is going on in a very uh, benign way, like a, a, a very well-timed and good interpretation, mm -hmm. you, may, you may say. And, uh, uh, and what happened in this group? So uh, it started with questions like, uh, okay, we are going to work remotely because now, by now, we were sheltered in place and uh, we were forbidden uh, to go out only 100 meters from home. So there was no debate, no question. Can we go and work in the room or do we have to work out uh, uh, to work remotely? How do you put the camera? Who is inviting whom? Who is entering first to the virtual space? Uh, is it better uh, to work on phone or on Zoom? What is the difference? Uh, what to do with people, with patients who refuse to move, who feel that it is an attack on the setting, that it is an abandonment? And we discussed this thing, uh, these questions, in a very intensive way. At the same time, discussing what is our reaction to what is going on. So <clears throat> from the start, it was not only, um, you know, cerebral uh, uh, professional questions, but, uh, but a mixture between the, the professional questions uh, and, and the very, uh, and the sharing of a very special, delicate, emotional moment. So the, the practical it, quickly opened up to a deeper reflection on the, the experience from an emotional perspective. Exactly, exactly. And this was in the context of the political threat, because we felt uh, under an attack of the pandemia, and many of us, felt under the attack of the political development. Yeah. Uh, so the combination was really uh, extremely powerful. Well, tell me about how it, how it continued to develop. It sounds like it, the, the conversation on WhatsApp deepened quickly. And um, part of your role was to, uh, if I understand correctly, was to synthesize the, the WhatsApp conversation which in turn uh, facilitated the, a deepening of the reflective process. Um, when, when you began this, this project, Mira, which is absolutely fascinating and, and unique, certainly from, from my perspective, I have not heard of, uh, of anything quite like this already to this point. And I have the advantage of, of course, knowing a little bit more about it, having spoken with you before, but was there a, was, was there a specific goal that you and the other organizers of this group had in mind or was it, something that you were inventing as you proceeded and, and also what, what, what were the effects that you observed? 
the goal was uh, to share. Uh, uh, it was stated in the invitation. The invitation was very clever, done by the by our president Judith Trieste and by her board. It was very clever in the sense that it was an open invitation to everybody who wanted to to take place in it. Um, and uh, the invitation was to share reflections and emotions and thoughts and uh, and whatever. And the whatever became very yeah. <laughs> the yeah. whatever became very important. Um, That's what usually also, happens with whatever. The, the whatever is <laughs> <laughs> whatever is holding <laughs> holding a lot and. Um, and, uh, and I think the, the last sentence in the invitation was like, um, like a, uh, I don't know, a warning sign of a kind, because it said that it is a large group. And uh, as a large group, uh, there are all kinds of dynamic that are not so simple. And that we have to be aware of it. And Tell it was like a prophecy. That. Yeah. Well, you know, a large group, a large group is not only something that is defined by the size. You know, like you go to a demonstration, there are a lot of people, but it's not a large group. A large group is when, uh, when people are interconnected and in, in uh, reacting to each other. And uh, we meet it in the tradition, in the group relation tradition. It's one of the method of work because it, um, you know, you you have uh, seventy people sitting in the same room. Not everybody can hear everybody. Not everybody can uh, can see everybody. And people, everybody speaks from here, from there. Is there a voice? Who takes the leadership? who is listened to, who is ignored. Um, people can feel extremely lonely in the midst of a lot of people around them. People can be very challenged and, and become very creative. It is by definition a regressive situation. Hence the vulnerability, but also the, the creative potential. And this is what happened in this WhatsApp, uh, WhatsApp group. It became both a regressive and a, a, a creative uh, potential. Maybe you, you, we share the screen sure. of, of the chairs. Let me see if I can do that. Um, one moment. You're testing my <laughs> abilities, uh, but I think I can get it here. Well, there we go. Well, so uh, the whatever. Ah, this is yeah, yeah. You can you can go back okay. to the first one. Uh, the paper that you refer to is called "Social Closeness at the Time of Social Distancing." the case of the Israel Psychoanalytic Society in time of COVID-19. And, uh, and the quote uh, below is uh, from Bion saying that the individual is a group animal at war both with the group and with those aspects of his personality that constitute his groupishness. Uh, so I'll come to it maybe in a, in a later moment, because for me, the, the, what happened in this WhatsApp group was really the tension that psychoanalysts have between being very private people, enjoying working in a one-to-one -one, one -one situation, and being in a group in which uh, they take shelter and they uh, find comfort. And, and the tension 
between these two elements, which characterize this psychoanalytic group, uh, is very is very uh, interesting. Can you uh, can, would it be possible, Miro, to uh, to give um, our listeners here some uh, one or two examples, perhaps, of what you would characterize as the some of the reflective experiences that occurred, as well as some of the uh, the regressive experiences, and I, I assume those two aren't necessarily entirely separate, uh, because of course sometimes the reflective experience can give rise to, um, to, to, to new understandings. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll talk about it uh, and the background of the orphan chairs and couches, the sure. second. Uh, yeah. Let me, all right, let me go back there. Um, One second. Uh, can you see it? Yeah. Well, there. Yeah. Right. Uh, this is uh, a collection of, uh, of photos that uh, would be shared uh, in the in the WhatsApp group, and um, I uh, put together uh, this theme of abandoned, neglected, orphaned chairs, uh, reflecting. And this is uh, this was one of the understanding that we got to that uh, this uh, uh, pandemia that uh, sent us home and, uh, and work uh, remotely with our patient orphaned us, us as analysts, from the physical presence of our, uh, <clears throat> of our offices and of, of our patients. And, uh, and people were, would talk about uh, phantom pains, longing uh, to the physical presence. And um, I saw, and, and, and this collection of abandoned cherry, it's uh, March, March and April. It is uh, when Israel is green, which is for a very uh, short period. And the contrast between the green and the flowers and the neglect and the abandonment and the loneliness that uh, is portrayed in these uh, photos um, is one example of, uh, <clears throat> of looking for, for uh, an expression, a self-expression, for the joy in sharing this uh, self-expression and for the ability to reflect on what it means when a group of people start taking photos of the same items and, uh, and also 100 meters from home uh, hold the notion of uh, how, how many treasures one can find when one is constricted uh, physically, geographically, and makes the most of, uh, of the resources available. And, uh, and being in a group together was a very, very important resource. Yeah. I mean, these, these pictures are, um, are beautiful. They are also haunting in a way and, um, and, and, and so poignant. Um, the, the, the emptiness of the chairs and the, the, the sense of abandonment surrounded by this beautiful setting. And the, of course, the beautiful setting is, is Israel, um, which leads me here to ask you another question, which I was wondering about as you were speaking, which is you know, you, you've already described the, the special um, context of the, the, the political situation in Israel that was going on simultaneous to the pandemic. Um, would you say that... that um, that, that, that there were other features of this project, this whole experience that were unique to Israel, 
Um, or would you say there are other things that you learn from this experience that might be more broadly applicable to psychoanalytic communities around the world? <clears throat> well, that's, that's a good question. I, I wonder about it. I don't have uh, an answer. I don't even know if, uh, if us in the Israeli psychoanalytic can even repeat this experience. Maybe it was also once in a time because of the combination of the unique combination of the events that happened because and we can check it right now. When I finished to write uh, my small paper uh, it was when the curve was flattened and the country was opening up and everybody was so proud on how Israel is doing so well uh, in comparison with uh, many other countries. Two months later now, it's the second wave already, and we are about to be ordered to shelter in place. We don't know. It may be, it may not be. Certainly the older population, which I'm part of, is uh, advised to, to go out as little as possible. So in a way we have a, a, a repeater of, uh, of, of March, but it doesn't, uh, and the WhatsApp group still exists. And from time to time, somebody will write there something, but it lost its, um, its special energy, it's lost its catexis, it's lost, yeah. it, it has lost the creativity. That's interesting. Um, w what happened to the first WhatsApp group, the political WhatsApp group? The political WhatsApp group is going on and now and is very active. So the uh, place for thinking has reduced its activity when the when we went out and returned to the new normal but the political uh, group is um, even uh, nowadays more active because we are now in the in the uh, economic virus and in the political virus yeah. and um, and uh, the israeli uh, you know the are uh, almost daily demonstrations, weekly demonstrations. The demonstrations are against uh, the prime minister that uh, is going on trial because of corruption. And uh, the demonstrations are uh, because uh, the economical situation became extremely worrisome with lots of people uh, having lost the the workplace, the businesses, and the um, reaction of the government was uh, was far, far, far from good enough. So the, there is a lot of political activities, and psych and our psychoanalytic community is very active. Yeah. There are very many, many active uh, members on behalf of themselves and on behalf of other who cannot be active. Yeah. The, you know, the, th that makes a lot of sense in terms of the continuation of the political WhatsApp group, but do you have any uh, speculation about why the more reflective WhatsApp group, that, there, that it faded away to some degree and that, that with this second wave of the, of the pandemic, it, 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 that there wasn't a second wave of reflection? You know, my hypothesis is that uh, what brought us together was really uh, was a, 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 an acute need to have each other as a as a psychoanalytic community, and uh, and because it took off immediately, you know, like a fire uh, in a dry field. Uh, it, it talked to a lot of people, 150 people are a lot of people yeah. to share experiences and the experiences were very, very personal. 
there were dreams that were shared, very personal dreams. Uh, there were uh, poems that uh, members wrote at the moment. And uh, there were, was a lot of music, emotional music that would be shared. So uh, the container, the emotional container was, I think, really uh, fantastic. It was inviting and it was, um, and it was uh, feeding. It, it was inviting and providing. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, you are also familiar with uh, group relations and large group uh, terminology. And uh, we, we tend to speak of a large group as a phenomenon of, uh, of a faceless mother, that the large group is, this is a terrible image, of course, a faceless mother, a mother that you cannot have a reaction from and that you are abandoned by. And uh, this uh, WhatsApp uh, group slash large group was, um, was a benign face, uh, faced mother was a very uh, containing mother, mm -hmm. very holding mother. And this is why it, it kept on going when it was needed. And I think uh, the proof of the pudding is that it's no, it's, it's no longer needed because even if we ha are in a second wave, we are not in the same emotional situation. The no. shock has faded out. Uh, that that makes sense to me, although, of course, that doesn't mean that the traumatic experience as this pandemic, you know, drags on for months and months and no one knows how long it will last. Um, the strain trauma of that experience must be continuing, wouldn't you, wouldn't you say? I think so. I think we, we don't even start to know what the effect is. Um, and what it will be on, on, on many, many levels, on the personal, on the professional, on the family, mm -hmm. you know, and the economic, of course, that's, uh, it goes without saying. And it will take us a long time to understand yeah. and to reflect. How, how does the experience of the Israel Psychoanalytic Society, uh, part of which is captured in what you've been talking about, but everybody, even the the 150 who didn't join this group are undoubtedly experiencing uh, this traumatic situation, right? Nobody is immune to it, as I said before. How, how does the experience of the IPS uh, dovetail with the, the unique experience of the Holocaust that it, in terms of how it is felt in Israel, the legacy of the Holocaust? <laughs> well, you know, uh, uh, we, uh, Israel, is uh, under the cloud of the Holocaust. It is, uh, sometimes it is a dark cloud, sometimes it is a loud, a light cloud, but this cloud is uh, always there. And the associations to the Holocaust are instantaneous. What was so frightening uh, at the beginning about the vision of uh, uh, hospitals being uh, flooded and, um, and the need that the doctors will have to decide whom to attach to the ventilator and whom not to do this kind of selection. So you talk about selection, it is Mengele, it yeah. is uh, camps and so on, it is unbearable. And especially when the most vulnerable are Holocaust survivors who are uh, quite old by now and who, are, uh, who were the most uh, vulnerable part of the society. And would they be resuscitated or not? This was unbearable. So this was one level. Another level was that uh, the associations the associations, you know, you are sheltered in place, 
uh, and you are traumatized, but you know, your grandparents in the camps had it worse. How can you complain? You are privileged. You know, there is always the comparison. What do you have to complain? You have everything. You have, uh, you are not hungry. You are not cold. Uh, your life is threatened by, by an, uh, an invisible, anonymous uh, entity, not by a person who is going to kill you. So, uh, so don't complain, don't complain. And, and uh, in another specific concrete level, the, <clears throat> we are talking about the end of March and uh, mid of April. We have uh, we had a very moving uh, period of uh, Passover, which is you know the biggest family event uh, for Jews and in Israel especially, and the fact that families couldn't get together <clears throat> was really really painful. And a week after that was a uh, Holocaust Day which is always a, a very moving, a very deep experience uh, in Israel. So the combination of being uh, remote from your family and of uh, having all the, all the Holocaust associations, you know, in the WhatsApp group, people would share their family stories, the, uh, the stories of their grandparents, they would post uh, pictures of, uh, you know, like in the Holocaust uh, memorials, you would see this kind of pictures from Europe of uh, very typical Jewish uh, persons. And um, so this all, I don't know if I can uh, convey uh, the specific specificity of the moment, being frightened, being in a shock, having this cultural uh, heritage, having these uh, associations of the Holocaust and the personal levels and, and the societal levels, and uh, all this combining together to create a, a very uh, emotional and deep experience. You know, Mira, thank you for saying that. I must say what you were talking about really resonates with me because uh, I mean, you and I are friends. And as, as you know, my parents were Holocaust survivors, having survived uh, Auschwitz and, and Ravensbrück. And so the, uh, while I spent most of the pandemic in the U.S., certainly the, some of the experiences that you're describing um, feel very much um, close to home. So uh, it's an important dimension of this, to be sure. Before we, before we wrap up our conversation here this morning, I uh, want to end on a, um, on a more hopeful and exciting note, really, although all of this is, is hopeful in the sense that if we can learn something from it, it will do good for, for us as psychoanalysts, for our patients, for those who we care about and, um, and beyond. And that is, um, I, ha I have to say something about the fact that the group that you founded, PCCA, which is the Partners in Confronting Collective Atrocities was one of the recipients of the Sigourney Prize this year, which is the, the, the great prize within the field of psychoanalysis. And, um, and certainly listening to you talk about the IPS response to this collective trauma, um, uh, I, I want to ask you to say just a, a little bit about, about your work with PCCA, um, having just received the Sigourney and um, and how that work has informed what you've done in Israel. That's a long story, but I try to, <laughs> to make uh, to make headlines of it. Well, um, it it is. Uh, we started thirty years ago, thirty years ago, realizing that the Holocaust in is an unmetabolized object for the Israeli, uh, in the Israeli psyche. And uh, it is the same for the German psyche of the second and third generation. 
and that uh, we as psychoanalysts um, can contribute uh, to, <clears throat> to metabolize uh, in a better way this uh, stone that uh, sits in our heart. And that uh, the way to do it is by bringing the two populations together, the Germans and the Israelis, and that each does the work in the presence of the other. And this is uh, the unique thinking and the unique contributions. Contribution. And uh, we started mainly with psychoanalysts, both in Israel and in Germany. And um, uh, we are, I think, uh, 25 years after, 27 years after the first conference, these are biannual conferences, and they uh, enlarged their scope not only to German and Israelis, but uh, to other uh, nationalities and to Palestinians as well. And uh, we try to, to speak the unspeakable and to give uh, words to the unthought and uh, unspoken known. And uh, by that, uh, to, and, and to do it in a group process, not in, a, in, a, in an individual psychoanalysis, because we had uh, the experience, personal experience, and, and many people experience, that in psychoanalysis, there is a limit to how much you can process this kind of collective trauma. And to process the collective trauma, you need a, a collective to work uh, within the boundary of a collective. And this is, uh, this are, so we devised these special uh, conferences. And, uh, you know, to get the Sigoni Award uh, was very, very meaningful, not only because it's, uh, it's a life project for many of us, and it's, it is one of our main investment, investments for years and, uh, and for in the thinking and writing about it and so on, but uh, of making a really a good use of psychoanalytic tools outside the room and beyond the couch. And we think that psychoanalysis has so much to give to society and that um, for many years it was not kosher because the ideal was you are one on one with your patients in your uh, secluded room the legitimacy to go out of the room and, and to do work in the community, in the society, in, in many, many ways. I think psychoanalysis is such a treasure of, uh, of uh, thoughts and of uh, methods that we have to realize it. And, and uh, it's like you know, all the treasures that we meet one, 100 meters away from home, we have it inside us. It's very close yeah. to us. We have to translate it. Thank you, Mira. You know, uh, as someone who has devoted his career to working outside of the traditional consulting room, I, I couldn't agree more with what you're saying, the, 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 the value of, of not only working one-to-one, -one, but, but bringing some of these psychoanalytic ideas and perspectives on social problems, global issues of concern, I think is, um, is extraordinary and couldn't be more needed uh, than right now. So um, we will wrap up this conversation and let, let me just say that I am, I am so fortunate to have you as a friend. Uh, the psychoanalytic world is fortunate to have you doing what you're doing. And frankly, you're an inspiration to me and I'm sure to many others. So thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you, Carrie, it was lovely. <laughs> It's such a nice opportunity. <laughs>